Hi, everyone. This is Natalie Pace. And as you know, we're all things about empowering you to be the boss of your money, to live a richer life, to have a thrive budget, and to earn money while you sleep in easy as a pie chart nest egg strategies that earn gains in 21st century recessions and about perform the bull markets in between. Now, toward that end today, we are going to be joined by Dr. Jessica Lautz. She's the Vice President of Demographics and Behavioral Insights at the National Association of Realtors. Now, NAR is the leading source for real estate data statistics, information, et cetera, in the United States. So she and I will be discussing unaffordability, uh, both in terms of mortgages and rents in the United States. Uh, we're going to be discussing rising interest rates and how that is we're seeing price declines and uh, volume declines in real estate in housing and what the solutions are for unaffordable housing and what people really want out of housing and what's driving them to buy at an all time high and whether or not that can continue. So all of these things to not only give you insight about maybe a recent purchase you made or a purchase you're thinking about making or even if you're thinking about downsizing, but also hopefully to have that longer view that real estate really requires because it is a less liquid asset. There are some times when it might be really difficult to sell your home um, as for some people right now with rising interest rates. So we'll be addressing all that and we'll get started momentarily. And welcome, Dr. Lauts. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you today. Oh, I'm so excited to learn. I, when I saw that you were the vice president of demographics and behavioral insights, I was like, oh, great. Can we please get some insight into what, you know, I'm sure that there's various um, needs and desires of each demographic. Can you kind of just go over the difference between what the millennials and Gen Z, and maybe even there's a great deal of difference in there versus maybe Gen X and boomers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to home buying activity, I have to say the youngest generation, um, Gen Z, so they're the youngest adults right now. They're not super active in the housing market. It's not a surprise. They're probably still in college. Some of them yeah. might still be in high school. So we see them as about 2% of the home buying market right now. Uh, millennials, I think to everyone's surprise, are actually the largest segment of home buyers today. Um, we hear a lot of talk about them not necessarily wanting to buy or the avocado toast meme is very prevalent, but they're actually out there. They're purchasing homes. They are a force in the market. And they range from young 20s all the way up. There's a term geriatric or elderly millennials. They're, they're reaching 40 now. So they are active in the housing market. Different trends between each, young millennials and older. And then Gen Xers, um, I have to say it's a pretty interesting generation. They're often skipped over when we talk about boomers versus uh, millennials. I, I think the Gen Xers kind of get lost in the in the uh, mix there. But they're actually in peak earning years. Um, oh, dear. There we are. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, they are in peak earning years right now, uh, right in the midst of their career, often have a lot of hurdles, though, because they may have kids over the age of 18 who have boomerang mm. back. They could be taking care of elderly parents. Uh, so this is an interesting generation for sure. Uh, they have quite a bit of money at this point, but they also have a lot of baggage essentially moving mm. with them um, as home buyers. Uh, boomers, I think they're always a fascinating generation. Yes, they are towards our oldest generations that we have, but I have to say older boomers versus younger boomers. Yeah. One may be actively working while the other one is fully in retirement. So, um, very different trends when it comes to home buying activity between each one of those as well. Do you see like, especially, um, you know, as the boomers near retirement or in retirement, are they needing to downsize? Have housing costs gotten too expensive for them? 
You know, what's really fascinating about boomers is I think they've reinvented seniors. Um, they really are a different generation than we look at the data in the past. They're not downsizing by space. If they can find a more affordable property, they certainly will. But mm -hmm. when it comes to their space and their square footage and how much room they want, they actually are kind of chasing the grandkids. They might be moving neighborhoods to follow their grandchildren and they end up wanting a pretty large home and a nice new home. So a newer property, um, a place place where now they can afford all the bells and whistles because they have a lot of equity that they've mm -hmm. earned as being past homeowners. So now they can put all these tech features in, put smart home features in, green features even, um, and they're embracing all of it. They're loving it. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. You know, I know that um, maybe last year and certainly the year before that, we were seeing a large trend towards larger homes and intergenerational housing. Mm -hmm. Did that change in 2021 um, uh, or is it changing now? What are you seeing now? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So the the whole idea of multi-generational living and lots of generations living within this household, it peaked. Um, we did see a, a very strong share at the beginning of the pandemic. And the number one reason was really to bring elderly parents into that, into that family home. So out of a nursing home, perhaps out of assisted living, living in a perhaps safer environment with COVID, but loneliness as well, all of those being major factors. Um, we have seen it decline uh, recently. I think it's more of a platform so though, because I, I suspect that this is a very attractive way to live for a lot of people, regardless of whether it's an elderly parent, it could be an older child who's over the age of 18, but you know what? Lots of generations mixing incomes, buying a larger home, having yeah. that family support system, maybe even two single moms who are sisters, having that ability to have cousins living in the same house. And yeah. that's a great support system at the end of the day. Yeah, and it's certainly, you know, when you think about it, one person living in a smaller house is typically more expensive than mm -hmm. getting that bigger house. I know as a young single mom, I teamed up with another single mom and it can really cut costs. That's brilliant. Yeah, I, you were ahead of the curve then because I think a lot of people are doing that now and they're being creative. People want to enter home ownership, but it's so unaffordable for so many Americans that being able to get onto the equity ladder, start earning that housing equity is so important, even if you're doubling up as a roommate or perhaps in a family scenario as well. Yeah. And I mean, do you feel though that um, with prices so high, unaffordable, rising interest rates, sales dropping, uh, prices at least weakening, some areas mm -hmm. dropping, do you feel that people do need to be concerned about buying, A, not spending more than they can afford, and B, um, maybe not buying high. How do you feel about this? Yeah, you know, I think it's true in every environment. It's true in every market. You really should stick to your budget. You should know what you can afford on. You should know what you can budge on. And maybe that's the location. Maybe that's the condition of the home and you're going to DIY some features within it. But you have to know your wish list and you really should stick to your budget. You really shouldn't stretch in any environment. But I do think it's especially true. We are in a rising rate environment. So knowing what you can afford, staying in close contact with your mortgage broker, with your lender, because if rates rise suddenly, that home that you were looking at, that neighborhood that you were looking at, that might be out of reach now. So making sure yeah. that you are staying in close contact, making sure if you do have a lock-in effect, you know what that day is and when that deadline is that you really do need to move. Yeah. And I, I love that, you know, prior to interest rates rising, there were so, a whole lot of people were getting that low interest fixed, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we didn't see many arms at all. We're starting to right. see a few more these days, but yeah, very good points there. Now let's talk a little bit about the flight to the suburbs because prices were pushing people out of the cities mm -hmm. into the suburbs. So can you tell us a little bit about that trend and um, especially given behavioral insights, because prior to that, what we were seeing is that people really loved living in the city. They love mm -hmm. micro mobility. They love the fact that they could walk to go get their groceries. And now if you move to the suburbs, you might have to drive 20 minutes to get your mm -hmm. milk. So are you seeing um, how are these behavioral matching up against that need to buy something that's more affordable, that's maybe not at the top of their behavioral love list. Yeah, you know, it is really interesting. I think this is a trend, obviously it was happening before the pandemic, but it's absolutely accelerated during the pandemic. This flight to the suburbs, this flight to small towns, even to rural areas, as long as they have good broadband. 
And we know that people <laughs> are really attracted to it. You you have to have good Wi-Fi right now. I mean, we're yeah. streaming everything from yoga classes to like what we're watching in the evening and all of our days work. So you have to be able to have that ability. But I do think it's really interesting, even in the very latest month of Realtors Confidence Index, this survey that we're doing on a monthly basis yeah. to Realtors, we found that 90% of home buyers were saying, no, I want to look outside of the city center. They're really attracted to the ability of having space, having that flexibility right now. Affordability is certainly key, but I have to underscore to what we've seen in the last few years is mm -hmm. a shift towards family connection too. And so maybe it's people moving back to where they grew up, or maybe it's mm -hmm. that you are down the street from mom and dad, and that's built in daycare, as well as that support system and a family home on Sunday to root for your favorite team, but also to have family dinner. And I think we've really seen this come out during the pandemic, how important that is to people as well. You know, I love that you mentioned that because, you know, there's been a lot of data supporting that, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but it was something I do a little women's empowerment on the side. And there's been studies that show, you know, there were women in India that were becoming CEOs at a much higher clip than even in the mm. developed world of the US. And it was all due to extended family. Like wow. if you knew that you could have child support, good family uh, mm -hmm. meals, you know, healthy food then, you know, the, the mother was freed up to actually pursue her career without having wow. that pull that sometimes can keep her out of the C-suite. So yeah. um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Boise, slowing down a little bit or no? It has been, but we have to keep this all, I think, in context. I mean, when we think about Boise, we also think about Austin or we think about Spokane, Washington. Um, all of these places are really been hot spots where people are moving yeah. out of really unaffordable places like Seattle or Silicon Valley, where yeah. home prices have gone up so rapidly and they're moving to a place where it's attractive. It's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful way of life. You can still go hiking on the weekends and that's very attractive, but we have to remember too, that that's not always going to be there. People are not always going to be flowing into these um, smaller cities, perhaps from where they had been um, for this affordability. So yes, it has slowed down, but we have to keep it in context of just how rapidly these places were growing. Yeah. Austin, Texas, 45% year over year home price growth. That's not sustainable. In no way is that going to be sustainable over a long period of time. Yeah. And it's, in, it's important for us again, I think to factor in that, I mean, it, it seems so long ago that we um, had the great recession. We had so many mm -hmm. homeowners lose their homes, but, you know, I think that, you know, and I know that you're on the realtor side and, and that, but, you know, I did see a study out by, I think it was bank rate where they did show that there were a number of people, a very large number of recent home buyers that were um, having buyer's remorse. They were mm -hmm. either they had more expenses than they realized. Maybe it was in the maintenance size or may, maybe it was more in the, the closing fees than they mm -hmm. realized. Um, also, the price was a concern. They felt like they might have bought too high. So mm -hmm. any comments that you feel comfortable sharing, we'd love to hear your take on it from, from your side and from your insights and wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually do a survey every year. There are profile home buyers and sellers. And we ask um, recent home buyers, essentially, did you buy when you wanted to buy? And we do see that the majority of folks do. And it's only a single digit, it's two to 3% on an annual basis who say, I wish I had waited. This wasn't the right time for me. And so mm -hmm. we consistently do get that data back. What I would say too, is that a lot of people did jump into the market and they were attracted to low interest rates. And so they may have paid a premium on that home or been in bidding wars. And so they yeah. may have felt like, oh no, I can't lose out on this, especially when I'm locking in a rate at two, two and a half percent. So at right. the end of the day, they probably still have price appreciation. They probably still seen equity gains in the last couple of years since purchasing that home, but perhaps, you know, going into it with your eyes wide open of what the expenses are of owning a home, because it's not just that mortgage payment at the end of the day, it's the upkeep, Thank it's you. the modeling, it's all of the things. And especially if you're making compromises, which a lot of millennials and even Gen Xers with high household incomes are doing, um, yeah. just because of the limited inventory out there, a lot of people do have to go into a home and say, wait, I have to change the hot water heater. Wait, this is, this is something that I the need plumbing. to fix on this home. Yeah. And yeah. that, that's not sexy. 
Yeah. And property taxes and insurance, right. you know, and right. I think that um, I, you may or may not want to discuss this. It's OK if you don't, if it's not your area of expertise. But um, you did bring in that people are interested in green features. But I also mm -hmm. would say let's talk a little bit about that, but also even, um, you know, how climate change can affect insurance rates. So we mm -hmm. see, you know, in areas like Key West and other areas like that, where all of a sudden the game gets changed on the insurance rules from, you know, FEMA, and then home buyers are seeing their rates really jump. So how much do you think that a homeowner should be factoring in climate change, maybe even green uh, facility, you know, green, fa um, so whether it's solar or better in proper insulation, mm -hmm. double pane windows, that sort of thing? Yeah. So I can't speak too much on the insurance rates or anything along those lines, just because yeah. of my limited knowledge on those topics. But what I would say is that make sure as a home buyer, you're educating yourself as much as you can, because the resources are out there for you to educate yourself on that. So make sure that you do understand what you're getting into. Um, don't know why my camera keeps popping off, but I will just blame my cats who were being very pesky earlier today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, when it comes to sustainability, what we have seen consistently is that homes in the U.S. are are older. They are they do need quite oh, a bit of work. Very interesting. So we do see that when home buyers move into a home, it's typically into a home that's more than twenty five years old. So it mm. may need a system upgrade. And so a lot of people take that opportunity to create a chance to have greener features within that home. So whether that is energy efficient appliances or an HVAC that's more energy efficient or having those double pane windows that can save a lot on energy costs. People are embracing that when they know they have to do a system upgrade. It's a perfect, perfect thing to talk about. And, and by the way, you know, any homeowner knows that a system upgrade is usually neat, whether it's the roof or the plumbing or whatever it is, like you've got to count on something like that happening every 10 years. And if you're purchasing a house over 25 years old, yeah. So that's something you're giving us such great insights. I can't thank you enough. I think I only have a couple of other quick areas that I just wanted to touch on. Uh, one is the student loan pause ends this mm -hmm. year. Uh, of course, they've extended it a number of times, but they have been pretty clear about saying it's not going to happen again. So how will that impact an already a market that's all we already see it kind of shrink in terms of buyers? Yeah. So the student loan impact for, for first time home buyers, especially is substantial. We know that their buying power is reduced. The ability to save for a down payment on a home as well as closing yeah. costs and all the money in reserves. It's, it really cannot be overstated how big of an issue it is for first time home buyers to be able to build savings while still paying down student loan debt. And so research that we've done within the last year actually saw that about a third of student loan debt holders did get ahead on their finances because they were able to pay it down, perhaps at a quicker pace without the interest, while oh. there has been that student loan debt pause. And so that's actually been able to bring them closer into home ownership. Um, and a lot of people moved home during the pandemic as well. And the bank of mom and dad and the home of mom and dad always helps as well to build finances. I would yeah. say when people go back to making that payment again, it's going to be a crunch, especially with inflation. But People have had warnings. They know that this was coming. So it's not perhaps a surprise to a lot of borrowers out there today. Okay. Now, is there any hope? Because we all know that the main reason why, and I think we should talk a little bit more about affordable versus unaffordable. I saw a statistic provided by your office. It's a few months old. You may have an updated one that mortgages were taking up 23% of the budget for anybody under 40. Rent 50 50%. Mm -hmm. So of mm -hmm. course, people are thinking I would rather buy than make the landlord rich. Um, mm -hmm. So is there any, I mean, if those statistics have been updated, please update them. But if that's where we're at, and that's crazy, is there any hope on the horizon? Um, is there like CRE that might be, you know, empty office mm -hmm. buildings that might become housing? Um, mm -hmm. What do you see? I mean, is there more enough construction to catch up to, you know, this lack of supply? Um, lots of answers on that one. What I would say is that affordability is incredibly difficult for renters and renters 
have continued to see rent go up. In fact, the latest inflation numbers, it really is talking about this rise in rent, especially if you go and you move and you sign up a lease with a new landlord, your rent is likely going to be higher. And that's very, very difficult for a lot of people uh, to be able to swallow at the end of the day and to think about saving for anything else, whether it is a car, whether it's a home, it's very hard to put that money together at the end of the day and, and make the balance sheet work. Um, what I would say on building, we have been underbuilding in the US for a solid 15 years. We do not have enough housing stock and we don't ha even have enough multifamily stock to yeah. support renters out there or potential home buyers, especially on the affordable price point. That's where we're really missing. And builders yeah. will give you a lot of reasons why, but at the end of the day, we just don't have enough units. And we need to be thinking about building repurposing, whether it is thinking about those office spaces, as many of us are home or working in a hybrid setting right now, whether it's repurposing vacant motels and hotels across the country, um, I don't know. I like Schitt's Creek, the, the TV show. And I know that that spurred a lot of development as well, but we need to be thinking about that as well as vacant malls. Those are out there in many communities and mm -hmm. you could have a lot of multifamily units come into a vacant mall and, and really think about development that way as well. So you're thinking on that, like, don't, don't just wait for the big uh, name developers to do it. Think about what you might be able to put together with your own little group, huh? Right. Absolutely. There's developers out there who want to meet the needs. And if if we think about all of the land restrictions that we do have that are holding builders back right now and the land costs, as well as the supply costs, if you think about an existing structure retrofitting it, of course, there's massive amounts of hurdles in that as well. But it may be a little bit easier than finding a new piece of land to build something brand new on. At least mm -hmm. you're halfway home with having an existing structure that you can retrofit. I, right. I think that there are some folks who want to meet the need and that could be a way to do it. All right, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, whatever it is that you want to do, but you know, we mainly are talking to Main Street. And I think that since we can see that the at least Gen Z and, and boomers, most of them have their homes. Now they may need to, you know, downsize, uh, move up to more affordable, but a lot of them have a boatload of equity. So let's talk more towards the younger generation and you know, what you might say to them um, about home buying um, benefits and ways to do it so that it works not just today and then tomorrow you have buyer's remorse or not just today and a few years from now you pay your student loan back and you can't pay your mortgage. You know, that, mm -hmm. that idea that you can actually really build the equity, stay there and have it be something where you don't feel um, property rich, cash poor. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say for young adults out there, the number one move to have is to go to HUD.gov, look at your local state, see if there's low down payment programs, see if there's first time home buyer programs that you may qualify for. If you're a teacher, if you're a nurse out there, there may be programs that are available to you that you're not aware of. And they're so underutilized. This could be in a massive opportunity for you to enter into homeownership and start building equity so that you can get on that home ownership rung. I would also say that a lot of people out there today are thinking of creative ways to enter home ownership. It sounds like you did it yourself, Natalie. Uh, there's a lot of people who are pairing up with roommates. If you've been renting with someone for a long time, what's the difference between pouring your money together and actually purchasing a property that maybe you'll live in for a period? Maybe it'll be an investment property for the two of you moving forward as well. So thinking creative ways, think outside the box because it's so difficult right now for a single individual to go into home ownership. And I would also say, you know, just keep at it. If you're paying down that debt, if you're chalking away savings, um, just keep at it. So it's it's a long-term goal. It doesn't have to happen overnight. And know that you're you're out there with a lot of Americans who are saying, I want homeownership. I want to get there. I'm just not there right now. And your realtor will help you. Your, your mortgage broker will help you. There are people who are on your side who will help you get there. Very, very good. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your um, behavioral insights into the demographics of the United States real estate market. <laughs> very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. All right. All right, guys. So we covered with Jessica Louts a boatload of information. And I think that um, I want to give you a few extra resources that you might need because 
home ownership is a long-term thing. It's something that you want to think about, not like, oh, you know, last year people made 18% gains nationwide. In some areas, it was even crazier than that, right? That's abnormal. So what you really want to do is make sure that it makes sense for 10 years. Also, it's a very good idea. Some of these things that Jessica mentioned are very good ideas. Can we team up with somebody and get a bigger place and have that actually mean that our, the amount that we have to put in is less or the amount we have to pay in our mortgage? Everything gets shared. It's much better. Like I said, I did it as a young single mom and it allowed me to launch my career rather than feeling like I was buried alive of bills and struggling to survive. So I want to show you a few resources that are really important. Um, I do believe that, act, uh, that you know, realtors and mortgage brokers can be very helpful. I also know that they are paid on commission. And so sometimes it can feel like you're being sold into something or you're being pushed to, to buy something. And um, in order to be the boss of your money, you have to be able to know things that maybe salespeople are not going to tell you. So I want to give you a few resources. If you are a parent, I don't care if your child was just born or you're, they're entering uh, college or they're in high school or they're already in college or they're thinking about graduate school, please do yourself the favor of ordering the ABCs of money for college. Both I and both me and my son, we both got better degrees for up to half the cost. I got a degree from the University of Southern California. Now, granted, I did get a great scholarship, but I came out with less than a rounding error of the debt that most people do. I know that costs have risen, but I'm telling you these strategies are essential. Anybody can get a better degree for up to half the cost if you are utilizing the tools within that book rather than just going with the flow. Obviously the flow isn't working because we have $1.6 trillion in student loan debt and it is gonna be an issue when the pause ends at the end of this year. Also, the ABCs of Money has a Thrive budget section with lots of tips on how you can stop making everybody rich, not just the landlord, the health insurance company, the utility station, the gas uh, company, uh, gasoline, the pump, all of that. And start use that money to start living a richer life and to set up a house that you can build equity in. We also have real estate case studies in there that it's important for you to be aware of. And I do factor in climate change. There's a checklist that you should go through on how to really find and purchase or build your dream home, including a lot of people that we have actually mentored to do that process over the past 20 years. So again, whether it's accessing the books at nataliepace.com, always go to nataliepace.com for the ABCs of money, the ABCs of money for college, so that you get the most recent edition. Um, also, you're going to be able to access these interviews and more at youtube.com forward slash Natalie Pace. So do share this important real estate interview with an expert and also with other expert longitudinal systems that work in the ABCs of money and the ABCs of money for college. Thanks again for joining me, Natalie Pace. Um, you can follow me on all my social networks. I would love to see you there. And here's where you can do that. Just go to nataliepace.com. You can click on to get me, join me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, and of course, Apple Podcast. Thank you so much. Um, you know that I love empowering Main Street so that each one of us can live a richer life and stop making everybody else rich, including the landlord. And Dr. Jessica Lutz, I can't thank you enough for your wisdom and your insights, and especially that you're so generous with translating this data into usable information for our audience. Thank you.